All right, uh, let's start off with our first big story. The series of attacks on farmers and their villages by Fulani herdsmen, especially in southern Kaduna, has continued unabated in recent weeks. Now, residents of these villages, uh, 53 of them actually, have been uh, often been attacked, uh, threatening to face the herdsmen fire for fire. But the Fulani herdsmen under the edges of Mieti Ala Cattle Breeders Association have extended the olive branch to southern Kaduna natives, asking them to embrace peace. And representatives of the herdsmen admitted that the people of southern Kaduna are peace-loving, but the cattle breeders say they have observed Nigerians across the country are now unjustifiably conditioned to hate the Fulani race. The leadership noted that attacks from them only come as reprisals. The said Nigerians should understand the three categories of Fulanis, uh, indigenous, semi-settled, and nomadic transhuman Fulanis. That's quite some categorization going mm. on there. Mm. We know how good the people of Southern Kaduna are. Therefore, we would not, we would discourage anything that will destabilize that area. We don't have any other area than Southern Kaduna. Forgive what has happened. Both parties should learn to forgive. This crisis will never end if you think you will go and revenge what happened to you. So we are appealing for all the parties to shed their swords and embrace peace. Well, will the parties involved sheath their swords indeed? Uh, that's another question. Well, we have joining us a uh, security expert, uh, Tanwa Ashiru. Uh, we're also expecting the president, Southern Kaduna People's Union, uh, Solomon Musa, to join us uh, from uh, Buja Studio. Good morning and Happy New Year to happy you. Happy New Year. It's good, good to see you. Thank you. Like now, the, the herdsmen uh, led by uh, Mietia La Cattle Breeders Association, that's the association that speaks for them, they are extending the olive branch uh, to the um, people who are the victims. Uh, should this be coming from them and at this time? I honestly don't think it should be coming from them. From what you even said, they've mm -hmm. categorized themselves into three. You have the ones who are from here, the indigenous ones. You have the ones that are semi-nomadic. And then you have the ones that are foreigners. Mm -hmm. So we've actually all concluded, and I think there's one thing we can all agree on, which is that the, the herdsmen that are carrying these attacks, carrying out these attacks, mm -hmm. are actually not the indigenous ones. Now, even he would agree, a lot of locals in Southern, uh, Southern Kaduna as well, they also agree that it's not the locals. They've lived together with the Fulanese in the area for a long for time. They years. know themselves. Mm. They know they're not the ones perpetrating these attacks. And, um, you know, I, I heard some of them talking about it um, last week on, on a program. And what they did was they explained that, you know, some of the herdsmen were the ones who, from the 2011, got stuck. They're from outside Nigeria. I think one thing that we can all sort of agree on is that the, the herdsmen who are carrying out these attacks are not indigenous um, Fulani herdsmen. And as such, I don't think the apology or the olive branch should be extended mm. from the indigenous What ones. some people would say is that uh, perhaps the indigenous ones will get the mercenaries to do their dirty works for them. I wouldn't want to do the dirty job myself. I'll get those who are not indigenous uh, Fulanis to do the work for me. But the intention really is from the indigenous. The intent, the, the motive, yeah. the malice yeah. really, oh, yeah. it's coming from the indigenous Fulanis. Okay, well, like I said, the ones, the locals who live in Southern Canada don't believe it's from them. I mean, they do know that sometimes maybe some of the local Fulanis may know who these um, herdsmen, these attacking herdsmen are, um, but they're not necessarily them. But you mentioned a really good point, which mm. is understanding the motives. And to be honest, when you look at this entire situation, the crisis going on, it's what we call an intelligence failure. And I'll tell you why. When we talk about intelligence, it's supposed to help us answer questions. Mm -hmm. The who, what, when, where, why, how. Who's doing it? Why are they doing it? Which is mm -hmm. motives. How are they doing it? Why, you know, what, what, just all the questions that we have are supposed to be answered based on intelligence that's received, analyzed, and disseminated. And so far, we are all still trying to figure out who it is. Hmm. Um, and again, okay, so we concluded that they may be the foreign 
herdsmen, okay, that are traveling across. And in fact, um, even the gentleman who you had on the soundbite as mm. well, there was an interview he conducted. And he said that this recent attacks are actually as a result of a situation that occurred not to, a couple of months back, which is a farmer had started farming on a specific area, which was along the grazing paths mm. of the cattle. And so he said when the cattle were approaching and the farmer is thinking, what are you doing? He actually ended up attacking the herdsmen. Mm -hmm. The herdsman that was trying to go across. Yes, and then uh, yeah. and that's how come you now hear about reprisal attacks uh, exactly. and, and all of that. I wonder what the implications of these are. Okay, so if, if that is if the, that's case, the case, then can the indigenous Fulanis absolve themselves really of any blame? Really? All right, we'll, we'll find out, of course, uh, in the course of time. Now, uh, in Nigeria, the Fulani and the Hausa people dominate the northern um, states, uh, where the population that is well over thirty. Uh, million uh, people. Now the Fulani people are largely nomads and due to uh, the peculiarity of their activities as herdsmen, they move from one place to another in search of pasture uh, for their cattle and in the process encroach on farmlands, uh, destroying crops. Uh, well, attempts by farmers to prevent them from causing havoc are met with stiff and violent uh, resistance. In those times, the farmers are overpowered, injured and killed. Let's uh, give you some more background information. In 2015, for instance, the mm. clashes between local farmers and Fulani herdsmen took another dimension and became alarming after the herdsmen repeatedly attacked communities in Benue State, killing thousands and sacking communities. Now, according to statistics provided by the Institute of Economics and Peace, 229 people were killed in 2014, up from 63 in 2013. Benue State remains the hardest hit in recent times as more uh, than 100 farmers and their family members were reportedly massacred in three local government areas of the state in 2015. Of course, remember Agatu and all the other places in Benue State. Now let's look at the timeline of these uh, attacks. In February, March and June 2016, more than 500 people were reportedly killed in different communities in Nagatu local government area in Benue State. Mm. In April 2016, Fulani herdsmen attacked seven villages in Nimbo in uh, Ozo one in local mm. government area of Enugu State. Forty persons were reportedly killed in April. In June 2016, the killer herdsmen wreaked havoc in Delta State. More than 23 people were reportedly killed. And the police uh, recovered 20 AK-47 rifles, 70 Dane guns, 30 double barrel guns and over a thousand live ammunition. Now mostly from Fulani herdsmen during this period. Uh, and in April 2016, farmers in Lagilu local council area of Ibadan, or your state, alleged that a group of Fulani armed men attacked their communities at night, injured a guard and carted away valuables. Now more recently, the herdsmen seem to have shifted focus from Benue to Kaduna State, uh, the southern part uh, specifically, killing scores of people. On Christmas Eve and on Christmas Day, armed Fulani herdsmen attacked and destroyed Goska village, killing, maiming and burning. This attack occurred in spite of the 24-hour curfew imposed by the state government. Mm, okay, that curfew happened and right in the midst of that curfew, you still had Fulani herdsmen killing. It is obvious that it's not limited to any particular area. Yes. They're spreading across Nigeria, whether you're talking about the, the, the uh, places like Kaduna, Benue, way down southeast mm. and all of that. So now when, when we say that this people, there, there is a likelihood that they're not Nigerians, what are the implications of this? Well, I mean, okay, when I heard uh, an assistant AIG who was talking about the fact that they've made some arrests, and mm. I remember the presenter asked him, and said, oh, sir, so these people you're arresting, are they Nigerians, are they foreigners? Mm -hmm. And he, he evaded that question completely and kept insisting that, you know, if they're foreigners, we have to hand them over to immigration. So at that point, we have to start looking at each other and thinking, okay, okay, wait a minute, everyone. Whose responsibility is this? Is it the responsibility of the police? Mm -hmm. Is it of the DSS? Because it's terrorism that's occurring within the country. Mm -hmm. Is it the NIA, which is a national intelligence agency, because they're foreigners? Okay, who are perpetrating attacks here? Or is 
it immigration? Because we know that these are foreign people who gain access into the country. And then everyone wants to slap that ECOWAS law, you know, slap it down and say, well, you know what, we're still protected. I wonder what the law says if they say the people coming to your country, if they're killing your locals, mm -hmm. oh, we're still protected. No such thing. I mean, look at the EU, for instance. You know, people in the EU can travel across the different EU um, states, different yeah. EU countries. But what do they do? They track them. You can't just cross in and they won't know that you've crossed into, you know, into Germany or any of the other countries. And so that's the same issue here. Doesn't that speak to the issue of um, failure of intelligence that you talk about? Exactly. No data and all of that. Of that, also of porous borders. Mm -hmm. And then even of arms trafficking. Now, one thing that we did currently is that when, we, um, when this kind of started, we noticed a correlation between the fall of Libya, which we know that they said a lot of weapons had been flooded yeah. into, you know, into the markets in Africa. And so when we know that these guys are, you know, traveling across, is anyone actually searching what they have? Because, it, you know, we've seen in the past where they are trafficking as well, weapons across. So um, even the, the Sambisa forest mm -hmm. now, the, the, the army celebrated the capture of Sambisa forest mm -hmm. and this, uh, the, the Boko Haram terrorists were chased out of Sambisa forest where are they exactly uh, they've, they've been dispersed <laughs> and you know and that's one thing you know someone asked me the other day that wait a minute you mean they went into San Visa where Chicago was supposed to be there but he escaped he got away so in essence what happened was you know they went in there chased them out mm -hmm. now we're finding that they're arresting Boko Haram you know members across Nigeria mm. you know so um, there's there are whole different dimensions here mm. really that come into and play. of course there are questions as to whether these people are really herdsmen or whether they're just uh, Boko Haram in another name uh, of course let's uh, quickly take a short break but uh, be reminded that uh, you can continue to watch the show on TVC Nigeria and concert channel 190 DSTV 418 go to 45 and AC TV it is 510 Tanwa is still very much with us mm -hmm. quite a lot to learn this morning so stay with us Right here, welcome back. It's TVC Breakfast, and we're looking at the Southern Kaduna um, killings by Fulani Herzman, in quote. Uh, w well, we have uh, uh, Tanwa Shiru, a security expert, right here in the studio with us uh, discussing this. And we've just been joined by Solomon Musa, who is the president of Southern Kaduna People's uh, Union. So, Kapu, good morning, and thanks uh, for joining us this morning on the show. Good morning. Thank you very much for affording me the privilege. Yes. Uh, now, the Miyatia La Cattle Breeders Association, they've uh, extended uh, the olive branch to uh, southern Kaduna natives. Is this what you want to hear now? Well, it's, it's not uh, being docile at all. It is the accommodating nature of our people. Our people have always been very accommodating. And, and so sometimes it could be misinterpreted for docility. It's not docility at all. Uh, in, when you come to Southern Kaduna, you find all kinds of people, all manner of people who have always embraced everybody. Uh, but, but you see, uh, because we believe that there is a strength in, 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 in diversity. That's, that's the average uh, Southern Kaduna person. But now we are beginning to discover that the, our open uh, and warm, uh, open, warm and generous nature is um, taken for granted. Uh, what, what's your take when you hear um, statements like the herdsmen killings are a result of reprisals, that the real perpetrators here are the, the farmers in southern Kaduna who have brought this upon themselves? What, how do you react to such um, statements? You, you know, you know, you know, some persons are working hard to change the narratives. Now, the focus that they are trying to shift is from the attackers. In all these attacks, I tell you, in all these attacks, what they have been concentrating on is not the attackers, is not to face the attackers, is not to confront the attackers, is not to stop the attackers, but what they have always and consistently been saying now is that, look, here, you don't have a right to defend yourself, you don't have a right to protect yourselves, you don't have a right to have civilian JTF, you don't have, once the attackers come, 
just lay down, let them slaughter you, and that is that. And what we are saying is that this is strange jurisprudence, that if you ask the people to, to protect themselves, that you are actually, what you are committing is hate speech. And that, so what they are saying is that we should not even defend ourselves at all. And so they are changing the narratives now to saying that it is actually the, the, the farmers that brought it upon themselves. Now, there is no farmer living in his own house in the night that gets attacked that, you know, it's not the farmers that go out to attack anybody, but the attackers come while people are sleeping, people in their houses, people in their farmlands. Now, as I speak with you now, within this past seven days, Sonje community was under attack. Uh, about three days ago, uh, a, a, a village head was killed by gunmen uh, in Kanimkong district again, around, uh, around Goska. Another person was killed. It has been killing galore, and yet we have a curfew, yet we have security presence, yet we have them. So we, 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 we are perplexed. Yes, a very perplexing situation there. Now, uh, let's uh, just hold on, uh, gentleman and lady. <laughs> uh, let's bring you some more on this. Uh, now, the Christian Association of Nigeria, CAN, and the leadership of the Catholic Diocese of Kafanchan in Kaduna State say more than 800 people were killed in that attack. Now, farm produce estimated at 5.5 billion uh, were also destroyed. A total of 1,422 houses and 16 churches were also burnt during the attacks. Sunday the 8th was another week of killing in southern Kaduna and Delta State. Five persons were reportedly killed by Fulani herdsmen in the state, two in southern Kaduna and five in Delta State. Back mm. to you, Solomon. You were mentioning the Sergeant Village, the attack that happened just over the weekend. Uh, the report we got that as of that day the attack happened, the, the presence of the security men, soldiers, they, they were there, deployed to that particular part of, of the country in, 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 in like 15 trucks. That's the report we got. And that attack happened under their nose. Where were they when the attack happened? You see, the trend consistently had been this. The soldiers, the security personnel have not demonstrated the capacity of going to the bushes to the flashpoints to confront the attackers. The major concentration is on those who have been attacked. Immediately after an attack, what they do is to go around and make sure that if you have any kind of weapon, and this could be maybe cutlasses, etc., bow and arrows, to defend yourself, to protect yourself, what they do is to disarm these people and leave the people completely vulnerable. And so, the, you, you, you have a scenario where you have a, a helicopter or several helicopters on, on surveillance, you have uh, security personnel on the ground, boots on the ground, and yet these attacks continue unabated. So we, we really do not know. Is it that the security agencies are complicit? Is it that the security agencies are incapable? Is it that the security agencies are unwilling to defend us? We really do not know. And these are the questions that we are asking. And I wonder who's going to answer these uh, questions. <laughs> um, uh, Tanwa, is it a matter of uh, complicity on the part of security operators? Or is it that they're just not uh, capable? And then again, in, in the midst of all of this, uh, when President Buhari gave his New Year's speech, he didn't really say anything about Fulani herdsmen killings. How do you respond so, to that? Um, you know, I think it's incapability. Mm. Uh, because if you think about it, one of the ways by which they have to, to tackle this, well, first of all, even the CP mentioned mm. that in order to patrol or to make sure that all of Southern Kaduna is actively covered, we're going to need at least a million policemen. I don't know if you guys saw and that that's headline. that's totally possible. Yeah, uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and so what happens is there are not enough manpower that are there. Mm. Number one. Number two, you actually need to employ the use of technology. You know, they check and they track grazing paths all the time. You can detect from the air when a group of people are walking through the bush heading somewhere.
you can detect mm. from the air. You know, that's if preemptive, burning. preemptive approaches you're talking about. What even, if when the attack, the attack even is happening, while the attack, just the, the one mm -hmm. that happened la last weekend. Even while it's attacking, yes. and that's part of what they're supposed to be doing. Mm. If you really have people, security agencies who are on top of the situation, this is the area of operation, this is where they're looking. And the moment they get an alert that says, look, an attack is taking place, immediately they can deploy their air assets to go over there, hover around, figure out where these people are coming from, and be able to radio down to your troops on the ground and say, hey, go to this specific location, this is where they are, go ahead and get them. Yeah. But we're not seeing that at all. And to an extent, in fact, the locals are even thinking that, is it that security forces are part of the people who are perpetrating these attacks? There have been allegations that helicopters mm -hmm. drop weapons for them. I know that was one mm -hmm. of the allegations in Benway. So they're wondering... Let's just say the remain allegations. Exa exactly. <laughs> they're allegations. But who is going to answer these allegations? Mm -hmm. Who's going to straighten it out? And to an extent, we have to ask ourselves, have our security agencies been honest with us? Not all the time. And one of the major challenges I have with them is they're not honest in um, communicating their deficiencies and saying, look, we're not capable of doing this. They will never say that. But don't you think that may even compromise the situation if they actually expose their, their, their weakness? Um, well, let, let's exposed. go back to um, <laughs> Solomon, who is in, in Abuja, there, the president of uh, um, Sokapu. Now, th there are so many issues here. You, you have um, the Islamic clerics only recently actually called for the arrest of... Uh, um, leaders of uh, the Christian Association of Nigeria, uh, the issue being that, according to them, they should be arrested because they are further complicating issues with the kind of language, incendiary language and provocative language that they're um, actually using and further causing more problems. Well, what's your take on that? And do you think this might just be Boko Haram by another name? Honestly, um, I read the um, press statement by the uh, ulamas, that's the, the Islamic clerics. Mm. And honestly, um, but for the fact that they are leaders, I would have said the, what they, they said is a little quixotic, um, is laughable, uh, because take all the press statements that we have given. Take all the interviews that we have granted. What we have always said consistently is the people we had advocated that uh, for the people to take all available legal means to protect themselves, to defend themselves. Now, that was what happened in, in Borno. In Borno, the people organized themselves into civilian JTF to protect themselves. But this right, this basic right is being denied Southern Kaduna people. I don't understand why you are not concerned about the attackers, but you are concerned, you are saying our speeches are incendiary. In which way are they incendiary? To ask people, if you ask someone when he builds his house to put burglar proof, if you ask someone to take a security man, if you ask someone to put security fence, that you are actually uh, 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 inciting the person to go into violence, we have never asked people to attack. We have always consistently told the people our people should never attack innocent people, our people should never go on reprisal mission, our people should always conduct themselves in, the most, in, in a lawful manner. So I don't know what they are saying about that. You know, it's, it's quite strange. It's, 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 like I said earlier on, looks like they are trying to rewrite even legal norms. They are trying to have new jurisprudence and it's quite strange because the constitution gives us a right and guarantees us a right to defend ourselves. International legal instruments guarantee us the right to defend ourselves. So it's, it's quite, uh, uh, you know. Now back to the question of whether it's Boko Haram. What we know, Boko Haram, whether it's Boko Haram or not, we think it is pure terrorism. Sheer terrorism, terrorism to, 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 to displace us from our lands, terrorism to take over, to, 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 to supplant us, because they had given a population ratio that we are 30% in the state. All and right. now another person recently came out on national TV again to say that we are actually 15%. So okay, uh, very Solomon, soon we'll be told that we are 5%. Okay, Solomon, we'll, we'll come back and have your final thoughts on this uh, issue. But uh, let's go on a short break now, Rich, and we more. Stay with us.
glad to have you back. You're still watching TVC Breakfast and we're looking at the headsman attack in southern Kaduna and some other parts of the country. We have Solomon Musa in our Buja studio and of course Stan Washiro is here with us in, in the studio. But let's just go to Solomon uh, one more time before we wrap up this uh, particular segment. Uh, Ngozi raised the, is raised the issue of uh, inflammatory statement. Will that be compared to what the governor of Kaduna State, such statements that he's made in the past, even before he became the governor, like on his tweet page and his Twitter handle, talking about anyone who kills a Fulani man mm. owes a debt that must be paid, must be repaid at any time, no matter how long he it takes. Is. And now he's the governor of the state. What do you make of that? You see, the focus always had been that the Fulani man does not forgive, uh, and, and it's, it's quite strange. They are talking of the fact that we have made incendiary remarks by telling the people to protect themselves. Yes, we, we, this is what we did, and none of them has been arrested. It, there is nobody that has focused on them to say, look, these people that have the boldness, the courage, the temerity to come out on national TV, to come out in the media to say we are on reprisal mission they should be they should be arrested no 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 they are not arresting them at all now the southern Kaduna man is saying look you have marginalized us 90 percent of federal institutions are in the north you have marginalized us in terms of political appointments you have marginalized us in all areas we are not complaining but now you are not satisfied with that what you are doing now is to come and kill us you want to exterminate us you want to decimate our population you want to supplant us you want to throw us out of our land and that is what we are saying with all sense of responsibility that we will not sit down and allow people to come and finish us to come and exterminate us now we uh, for on, a, on, on another note we are saying look if Kaduna State does not need us, if in fact Nigeria does not need us, while we, 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 we are prepared, we are ready to go it on our own. Well, Please, I doubt if it has come to that, and we don't uh, excise pray us from that Nigeria. it does. Excise um, us peacefully. Solomon Musa, yes. thank you so much. President of Sokapu, that Southern Kaduna People's Union right. there, uh, speaking to us from Abuja studio. Uh, well, we do hope it doesn't get to that point. Yeah. Uh, there's prejudice, of course, in the mix with the statement that Busalami just referred to there coming from the governor, the governor of, the of the state. And then you now hear that uh, there's a possibility of compensation for Fulani herdsmen yeah. uh, who have uh, their, you know, who've had their cattle killed and all, and all of that. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's a clear case of someone comes and then they kill. They come to your house, they kill people there in your house and then you say, you know what, okay, I'm sorry, you know, I know you're upset, so I'm going to come give you money so you stop coming back to my house to kill all the occupants of my house. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. There, you know, as a government, we, are, we ought to say, and the job of the government is to protect the rights of the people, protect the mm -hmm. people of the country. And so what they're supposed to be doing is going over there to say, you know what, I'm sorry, but Nigerian lives matter. And for that reason, no more killings. Every no matter Nigerian how much life. we dissect this thing, mm. it doesn't make sense. Yes, and I doubt if we've been able to even <laughs> find a way forward out of this uh, a really um, sad situation there. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tanwa Ashiru, security expert, and of course Solomon Musa, President So Kapu, uh, with us on the show this morning. There's a lot more to talk about. We'll be looking at the Senate and the SGF and a lot more this morning on TVC Breakfast. Stay with us. Mm -hmm.